So I'm dreaming of this place. It's Leopold's Book Bar Cafe. It's the dreamiest bookstore, cafe, and cocktail bar combo you'll ever find. And it's right here at 1301 Regent Street. They've got the latest books from around the world, wines to sip or take home, and live jazz, plus open hours until midnight most nights of the week. You can grab a drink or dessert and just kick back at Leopold's. Today on CityCast Madison. You may not have considered it, but our city trees put up with a lot. Madison trees withstand freezing winters, sidewalk salt, power lines above, concrete all around, storms, and the occasional car crash. Not to mention insect pests like emerald ash borer. For all that trees put up with in our city, they give us so much. They give shade, shelter, beauty, air, home for animals, and planet cooling. So today, we're talking to the people who speak for our trees. Meet Madison City Forester, Ian Brown. It's Monday, September 18th. I'm Bianca Martin, and here's what Madison's talking about. Ian, hello. Good morning, Bianca. How are you? I'm doing really well. We are right off the bat going to throw producer Dylan's dad under the bus a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) Long story short, Dylan's dad really likes the tree outside his house on the street terrace. And he was upset that the city was planning on cutting down this tree. And the civil servant that you are, you decided to pay him a visit recently. How did that go? Uh, I thought it went really well. So to kind of set the table, the community of Madison has many passionate tree advocates, tree lovers, and that's part of the reason that I'm here. That's something that I can fully appreciate as a professional. Kind of to put it bluntly, to be here in charge of trees in a community that loves trees as much as Madison does is a really special and unique opportunity. And So, you know, this was an opportunity, uh, while I can't meet with every resident uh, face-to-face, this was a a unique circumstance, kind of a conversation about what's the condition of the tree, what is our management responsibility as the city, and so that's kind of where our conversation went. You know, ultimately, too, you know, even before arriving to the property, it's like, it's very clear that we are aligned in the sense that, uh, you know, Dylan's dad loves the tree. And guess what? I love trees too. So we're not really that dissimilar. It was just, we came to a different conclusion with this particular tree until we had that conversation. And so you guys ended up on the same end. Yeah. He, he, he said something along the lines uh, near the end of our conversation of, I don't know why I'm happy about the outcome because I'm losing the tree, but I'm really happy and excited to be getting the new tree. So that was uh, an incredible win in my book and, you know, exciting to be able to work with someone who, again, clearly does love the tree. Trees do have a natural lifespan, just as humans do. And this was uh, a circumstance and situation where, while I can't maintain their current uh, tree, this is an opportunity where you have a very engaged resident that can now grow, cultivate, support a a new tree in that same place uh, and watch it grow into maturity in front of their house. So that's really exciting. That is so exciting. And talking about engaged citizens, I'm going to make an awful um, joke as I tend to do, but it's the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Looking at Mr. Dylan Brogan coming from Mr. Joe Brogan, (laughs) engaged (laughs) resident of Madison. I love that outcome. And it sounds like, so the tree was nearing its end um, and you got to explain the reasons why and and the health of the tree. And it just, it's better to get a new one in there. The city of Madison has a professional municipal workforce. Uh, We are responsible for maintaining all of the trees uh, within the city. Uh, Our our primary focus is between the sidewalk and the curb. So we call those terrace trees. Um, We don't maintain the only public canopy in the city, though, as well. I mean, there's park trees, so that's maintained by the Parks Division. There's stormwater greenways, which are maintained by the Engineering Division. But we do all work together. I want, as the city forester, to do the best that we can to support 
the broad urban canopy and that crosses property boundaries. So yes, I want to lead the way in what we do for public trees, but also provide, you know, kind of a sphere of influence, a helpful voice or areas of support for private canopy as well. Yeah. So that could be individual residents, schools, school age kids, you know, those are our future leaders of tomorrow. And if they have an appreciation for trees, if they have an engagement and connection to trees, I think that's better for the community and that'll, that'll be better for us as a, a society as well. well. I recommend we keep reading the Lorax. <laughs> I speak for the trees. <laughs> Instacart helps you get beer and wine delivered in as fast as an hour. So whether you need to fill the cooler for tailgate season or fill your glass for Pinot by the fire season, you can save time by getting fall sips delivered in just a few clicks. Visit instacart.com or download the app to get free delivery on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum order $10. Additional terms apply. Must be 21 or over for alcohol delivery where available. Instacart. Add life to cart. So, I mean, you're relatively new to town, but it sounds like you already have a sense that there are a lot more Joe Brogans walking these streets. So a lot of people who are passionate about trees in Madison. Would you say that's that's accurate in your experience so far? Yes. This is actually my second stint in Madison. After I finished grad school, I I was down here for about a year and a half, two years uh, working for the DNR downtown. And uh, that was my first experience residing within Madison and kind of where I first, I guess, fell in love with the town. I wasn't here that long, but the overall engagement, environmental awareness, the support for things green and blue and, you know, kind of how how willing the community was to, you know, put their money and their effort where their mouth was on those things is really exciting. And so, you know, when this position as the city forester was posted as an opportunity, I I was pretty set and comfortable in what I was doing. But the city of Madison presents a unique opportunity, both as a community um, and as a program that there, there aren't many communities like Madison across the country. That makes me so excited to hear. I mean, I I know that viscerally, but, you know, just hearing that across the board, including with our trees and our tree lovers, it definitely tracks. One thing, I'm I'm a renter. I'm not an owner. So I'm, I didn't really even recognize or think too hard about the fact that, okay, these trees are owned by the, you know, property owner and these are city trees, that sort of thing, the distinction there. When do you know when a tree is your tree versus when it's the city trees? Is it just that terrace space? you're speaking about? That's the primary focus for us as a municipal uh, forestry workforce. But, um, you know, like I said, there there are public trees elsewhere. You know, Madison is an extensive park system and those are in place and designed to be everyone's trees, everyone's green space, everyone's water. And similar, uh, the engineering space, those are trees that are in an area that are managed for stormwater use. But, you know, there absolutely is a need for green space there. So instead of having just, you know, a a concrete channel going through a neighborhood, it's much more palatable, both from an environmental and aesthetic perspective, to have it be like a a natural waterway with trees, forbs, shrubs along there and the wildlife that they support, too. Yeah, trees serve so much in the city like they really, really do. And like talking about stormwater. We're thinking about climate change so much these days and trees are huge. Tree cover is huge for cooling spaces, right? And is the city making different decisions right now for which trees to plant because of climate change? Uh, Yes, I think in the sense that we we have to have an eye forward for what uh, what kind of environment we're going to have. I was at a talk a couple of years ago and the, the presenter was talking about the impacts of climate change and what we would likely be seeing in other parts of the country. And they had forecast that Wisconsin, specifically southern Wisconsin, would have a climate similar to central Missouri within 100 years. Wow. Missouri is way different than Wisconsin right now. So kind of thinking about that, it's like, OK, 100 years seems like it's a ways off. But in the grand scheme of things, it's not even distilling it down a bit further in the the life of a street tree, which we hope to plant and maintain for 60, 80, 100 years, we have to start thinking about things now that can sustain life in like a Missouri type climate 
in like the planting decisions that we're we're making right now. Which trees do we plant? Where do we plant? How do we plant? Irrigate things like that. Oh, by the way, we might still have a polar vortex too. So they have to be cold hardy. So urban trees do kind of go through a lot. That's something that's exciting about this is kind of a career path. I feel like our role as municipal foresters is really to manage not only the resource, but the relationship that people have with their trees. Are you trying to attract people into the forestry? I would love to. We're always looking for good people. Okay, I, I'm getting those vibes. <laughs> like, just so you know, this is the real thing. We're Loraxes out here and we Urban are- Urban <laughs> forestry dovetails beautifully with what kind of the, the current, a lot of the current goals are for young professionals. They're they're less interested in, you know, finish school, punch the clock, work for the same employer for 35 years, have your pension and retire and, you know, just disappear. Where people are engaging and looking to, to do something is sometimes even less about money. It's more about work-life balance. It's about making a difference. It's about, you know, what ways can they make positive change for the planet, for their community, or leave a, a legacy going forward. And trees are that legacy. I mean, as a career path, you know, you can't dig up a tree and ship it to China, have it pruned and then bring it back. So wherever there's a tree, there's a job. You want to hire a professional to do this work. You know, no one asks who's the cheapest doctor. They all ask who's the best doctor. Same thing with arboriculture. You want to ask who's the best arborist to maintain your tree. But, you know, those trees as well, like the trees that you're talking about right now, having canopy, providing shade, all those benefits, they're coming from big, mature trees. Guess what? I didn't plant those trees. Those were trees of our parents' generation or probably even more likely our grandparents' generation. So what I'm doing is I'm I'm hoping to be an effective shepherd and steward of the canopy that we've had in the past, but make decisions in a conscientious way that'll project those benefits and hopefully even improvements going forward. So the trees that we plant and prune main, maintain today are ones that we're going to have for our kids or our grandkids generations down the road. Yeah, I, I understand Mr. Brogan's tree is like 80 years old, and that's kind of the natural life cycle of that maple it does shock me also how people forget, you know, it's like, oh, that was so long ago. It's like, it, it's really, really not. <laughs> so how many trees does the city plant every year? I guess two to 3,000. We're, we're planting, pruning, maintaining trees. So like over the course of their life, most of the places that we plant are like replacement trees. So a, a tree had to be removed. Um, that could be through natural decline. More likely it's from, you know, storm damage uh, we have an active program in place to treat our remaining ash trees. So we're not doing wholesale removals of ash trees anymore due to emerald ash borer. You know, you, you will have auto impacts. You will have storm damage. Um, older trees, uh, certainly normal maples, like, you know, we were discussing before uh, in front of Mr. Brogan's house, like that that had stem girdling roots. So those are... Stem girdle? Stem girdling roots. Girdling roots. So they're like getting crunchy together. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So historically, if trees were planted too deep, roots actually also need oxygen. And so if they don't get oxygen in the soil column because they are too deep, they'll grow up in the soil and kind of around the tree itself. And so when the tree is young, there's no problem because the trunk has not um, grown or expanded to the rate where they're actually in contact. But over time, and the real sad thing with stem girdling roots are that over time, when those trees really reach maturity, when they get big, now you have a root that's compressing against that the side of that trunk and it can no longer expand out. A human analogy would be like putting a rubber band around your arm. If you have it there for a little bit or if you have a rubber band when you're little, not a big deal. But as you grow and mature, if your arm gets bigger and you leave the rubber band there, you're going to have circulation concerns and potentially cause mortality of that tissue going down the road. And the trees are the same way, except they can't slide the rubber band off their arm. So that makes a lot of sense. We are much more conscientious of that as a arboricultural industry. But again, because these trees have, you know, decades of life, when there are changes, it's not immediate and across the whole population of trees that we maintain. So you could have trees that are 60, 80 years old that might have been planted in a different generation where stem girdling roots were really not on the radar. And then we're managing those impacts today. How did Dutch elm and emerald ash borer change how the city selects trees to plant? And also, like, what's going on with that whole situation and picture? 
they are still very present. It has changed the industry and specifically for municipal tree managers considerably. Elms used to be the predominant species in cities across the Midwest, and they they were large, majestic trees. They still are. It's kind of an artifact of global trade. So when we start to have international trade, you can have things, whether they're fungus, insects, uh, pests, whatever, that just hitch a ride on commercial transit and travel. And that's kind of what happened with some of these things. You know, emerald ash borer was not purposefully introduced. It was accidentally introduced probably on Palwood, and it came in around the city of Detroit in their shipping area. So when you start moving individual pests around the world and you introduce them into locales that have not had those before, the, the local populace doesn't have any natural resistance to it. And so what ends up happening, like for emerald ash borer, for example, I'll, I'll use that because that one's more in my realm. Dutch Elms disease is a generation ago, still present. We still watch for it. But EAB has been present in China. That's where it's from. There is ash in China, the Manchurian ash, and it's not a problem. Like EAB will end up parasitizing ash if and only if it's stressed. So usually a lot of these things end up being secondary pests. So if they have damage, either storm damage, construction damage, drought stress, then you start seeing this circle of decline where the tree is stressed. And so then it becomes more likelihood to uh, be parasitized. The problem was with EAB when it got introduced to um, either our American white ash, green ash, things like that. Those ash trees have never seen EAB before. And so they're not acclimated to or adapted to fight or ward it off. It's just like humans with disease, you know, and viruses, you know. Absolutely. So when you have a new disease like COVID and we don't have a vaccine for it, it can wreak real havoc on people. But then if you can start to prime the population to be like, okay, this is what your immune system needs to look for, then you're better off. In nature, you know, that takes thousands or millions of years to develop those relationships. Global trade has just accelerated that. So, you know, where we have things like either pesticide treatment to help, like a vaccine, or you have the nursery industry, which is searching for and developing resistant cultivars. So we are planting elm trees again. They are not straight American elms. They are cultivated varieties that are resistant to Dutch elms disease. So they're not Dutch elm proof. Getting vaccinated doesn't make you immune to anything, but it certainly reduces the likelihood that you would get sick from something. And so the the trees in the nursery industry are the same way. Oh, I love talking about science so much. And speaking of science, is there a formula that the city uses to like plan this this stuff out? There is not a specific formula, so I can't plug in something and then it runs the model and it spits out, you know, something up. But there there is thought and process that goes into it. When we're planting trees, we are trying to maximize the amount of canopy that we would uh, be able to support going forward into the future. Me personally, I'm not looking to just plant more trees. I, I care less about the stem counts that we have, how many trunks are out there. I do care a lot about the amount of canopy. So you can plant small trees till you're blue in the face. You're not going to really change anything. Who goes to seek out shade, shelter, and stormwater savings under a crabapple tree? There aren't very many folks. But you know who is going to go seek out all of those things under a majestic old oak tree? You know, like when you think of big old tree, that's what you're thinking of. And so what I'm looking to do and what we would like to do as a city is to plant large, we call them large stature or large canopy species wherever we can. So if if the terrace space supports that, we want to plant a big tree. Now, not every terrace space supports that. What if there's, you know, overhead wires or some other utility conflict? Maybe the terrace space is too narrow we'll still plant a tree, but I want to try and find ways to leverage those opportunities to plant a big tree wherever we can, um, plant a little tree where we can't, and then have a conversation of, you know, maybe I can't plant a big tree in your front yard, but maybe we can talk about it and you're energized and excited and maybe you can plant a big tree in your backyard. It's a holistic picture here to to maximize the the canopy. And I'm sure that like is impacting how, you know, your choices about how many trees to plant of each species, that sort of thing. You know, what we're trying to get away from and your examples of Dutch elm disease and emerald ash borer are perfect is 
historically in urban areas, we planted monocultures of things or stretches of things. So you might have a whole block of ash, you might have a whole block of elm. That creates a problem when you have host-specific pests. So the power of diversity, baby. Yes, please. And even, <laughs> even more than that, we want it within your block so that if you have the honey locust beetle, and I'm making that up, that comes and starts eating all the honey locusts, maybe you lose two trees on your block rather than your whole block so that we help to maintain and diversify canopy. So aside from human diversity within urban areas being great, guess what? Biodiversity is good too. And it makes the whole community more resilient. I love it. We should definitely end with some practical tips for folks about their trees. I'm sure people are thinking about that. What can people do to help keep their trees healthy? Uh, Watering and mulching is always something that's very easy to do. We've had a very hot, dry summer in the Madison area. And so what watering, and by watering, I mean, when you're watering trees, so, so tree roots are below turf generally. And so sprinkling your grass and even having green grass doesn't necessarily mean that the tree and the tree roots have access to that same water because the grass is sucking it all up first. So when you water your tree, you want to have a low flow rate over an extended period of time, like maybe just barely a trickle coming out of your hose and leave it on the tree for like four hours. If you can't do that or don't want to do that, you can do something as simple as get like a five gallon bucket from the hardware store and you drill a couple small holes in the bottom Fill that with water and then just walk away. That way, instead of like spraying the grass, you're going to actually have the water percolate out slowly. And that allows it to trickle down through the water column and actually get that water where it's accessible for the tree itself. Mulching is the other thing that's super easy to do and really beneficial. That helps to mitigate extremes in soil temperature. That helps to decrease compaction of the soil, helps to improve the water retention. I like free and cheap options, and both of those are kind of that, you know, things that you don't have to hire someone necessarily to go do. Once people start to participate, now they're invested in it. And so as opposed to the tree being just something green and woody in their front yard, now it's like, oh, that's my tree. I planted it. I maintain it. I do this. And then they start to feel ownership. And, you know, our conversation kind of started with the tree that happened to be in front of a private residence. It didn't happen to be a private tree, but I am... 100% certain that there was personal ownership of that tree. (laughs) Yes, that was clear. (laughs) That's an opportunity to help people connect with nature, with their tree. That's part of the reason that a, a large part of the reason that I gravitated towards urban forestry instead of traditional forestry. I'm really motivated and energized by the connection that individual people have with their trees. So I'm not managing just trees, but trees and people. Yeah, you are. And I bet people are going to be reaching out to you. And we're just super thrilled that you could join us today to talk about um, taking care of our city trees. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. That's Ian Brown, Madison City Forester. And here's what else Madison's talking about. Starting today, Monday, September 18th, Madison is doing a tree inventory. So if you see someone from a company named Davey looking at the tree in your terrace, that's what that's all about. They were hired by the city to survey all of our 100,000 street trees. They're starting on the far east side of Madison and will be working their way westward. They'll finish that up when all those trees are cataloged. This will give our forestry department a better idea of what trees we have. So, woohoo! And hey, if you're ready for our trees to put on their full fledged annual majestic color show, did you know there's a website that tracks this? Travel Wisconsin monitors the fall colors in every county and tells you when they're approaching peak beauty. We'll link to that in our show notes. And don't worry, we're also preparing a list for you of epic fall drives around Madison. So stay close for that. That's all for today here on CityCast Madison. I'm Bianca Martin. If you enjoy the show, why not share this episode with your favorite tree hugger? We'll be back tomorrow morning with more stories from around the city. Until then.